I think it's fairly urgent for the researchers to come to a consensus about whether these big chatbots like GPT-4 or BARD actually understand what they're saying. Um, there's clearly some people believe they do and some people believe they're just stochastic parrots. I believe the large language models and other large AI models are building a world model or building something that looks a lot like a world model. So my gut is that I do believe to the extent it's building a world model is conveying learning some understanding of the world. So there's been a lot of discussion recently whether or not LLM models, these AI models behind ChatGPT and others, do they understand? Can they reason? Do they think? What are words you want to use? The question is, is our children learning? Is this an intelligence that is in some way similar to humans, or is this just a very advanced autocomplete model that's spitting out statistically likely words, one after the other? And he posts a suite saying, do large language models really understand the world or just give the appearance of understanding? And then he talks about some evidence from Othello GPT shows that LLMs build models of how the world works, which makes me comfortable saying that they do understand. As yesterday's positive report card shows, children do learn. Do large language models understand the world? As a scientist and engineer, I've avoided asking whether an AI system understands anything. There's no widely agreed upon scientific test for whether a system really understands, as opposed to appearing to understand. Just as such, no tests exist for consciousness or sentience, as I discussed in an earlier letter. This makes the question of understanding a matter of philosophy rather than science. But with this caveat, I believe that LMs build sufficiently complex models of the world that I feel comfortable saying that, to some extent, they do understand the world. So Othello, a board game in which two players take turns placing game pieces on an eight by eight grid. I'm not familiar with this game, but they do have some diagrams on the paper that they wrote, so that might be helpful. So during training, the network saw only sequences of moves. It wasn't explicitly told that these were moves on a square, eight by eight board, or the rules of the game. After training on a large data set of such moves, it did a decent job of predicting what the next move should be. The key question is, did the network make these predictions by building a world model? That is, did it discover that there was an eight by eight board and a specific set of rules for placing pieces on it that underpinned these moves? The authors demonstrated convincingly that the answer is yes. Specifically, given a sequence of moves, the network's hidden unit activations appear to capture a representation of the current board position, as well as available legal moves. This shows that rather than being a stochastic parrot that tried only to mimic the statistics of its training data, the network did indeed build a world model. While this study used Othello, I have little doubt that LMs trained on human text also build world models. You know, with that, let's take a look at this paper. It's called Emergent World Representations, exploring a sequence model trained on a synthetic task. And so here we have people from Harvard, MIT, Northeastern University. Language models show a surprising range of capabilities, but the source of their apparent comp competence is unclear. Do these networks just memorize a collection of surface statistics? Or do they rely on internal representation of the process that generates the sequences they see? And so they have a variant of the GPT model made to predict legal moves in a simple board game, Othello. After yeah, your... actually, I didn't realize this, but I do know this game. I just never heard of it as Othello. And so here they basically describe the problem. So they're basically saying that some people believe that these models, they just have seemingly good performance from memorizing certain statistics and they're just autocompletes and stochastic parrots and that there's nothing really intelligent going on there. The sort of the counterpoint to that, that some people believe is that they do build some sort of world model. They do develop some understanding. They do develop some emergent abilities and skills that they were not trained for and yet somehow they learn to do. So they think of the board of Othello as the world, right? That grid, eight by eight grid as the world. But they don't tell the model that it is an eight by eight grid. They keep that secret. And in fact, the model has no previous knowledge of the game or its rules. All that it sees during training is a series of tokens derived from the game transcripts. So as they pointed out here before, or rather, I guess it was back on this page, you know, the moves might be D3, C5, F, F6, etc. So basically it's just these collections of numbers and letters that describe where on the board that move is taking place. And they uh, do not explicitly train the model to make good moves or to win the game. Nevertheless, the model is able to generate legal Othello moves with high accuracy. 
So in Othello, like we said, the world consists of the, the current board position. Quick explanation of how the researchers approach this problem. They want to figure out if Othello GPT, a computer program designed for the game Othello, truly understands the current state of the game board. Understanding the state of the game means knowing where all the black and white disks are on the board and what spaces are empty. To do this, they use a special tool called a probe. Imagine a probe as a detective that looks inside Othello GPT's thinking process. It examines the thoughts or internal signals of the program and tries to predict specific features, like the current state of the game board. We train this detective, the probe, to predict the game's board state by looking at the signals inside Othello GPT after certain moves are made. If the probe can accurately predict the state of the game board, it means that Othello GPT is actually understanding and representing the game's current situation. So one thing that we need to know to understand this paper is what a latent saliency map is. To better understand what happens in the hidden layers of the neural networks, we can use latent saliency maps. These maps provide a visual representation of the parts of the neural networks engaged in decision-making. In these images, for example, the top row are actual photos, and the AI is asked to determine if something is present in those images. For example, it's asked it it seems someone smiling, or someone wearing glasses, or if there is a blue square in the image. Below the image for that particular query is a latent saliency map that the AI used to to determine whether the image has those objects. For example, to determine if an image has someone smiling, it focused on the area around the mouth and cheeks. To determine if someone has bushy eyebrows, it focused on the area around the eyes and eyebrows. To find if there is a blue square, it focused on the blue square in the image. This shows that it's understanding what we want, and it's looking in the right place to find it. As a counterexample, there was an instance where a model that was supposed to detect if an image was that of a dog or a wolf started to sometimes mistake the two. It was later determined that the model looked for items in the background of the image to determine if the object was a wolf or not. Images of dogs in a snowy forest, for example, would be classified as wolves. By looking at a latent saliency map of that model, we would be able to see that if it was making decisions based on what it found in the background, instead of solely looking at the animal. And so here's the sort of published latent saliency maps. So each subplot shows a different game state. In the top, one prediction by the model is enclosed in the black box. So it's all of these ones. That's the thing that it thinks is the best move, or at least a correct move. It's the move it's predicting. And so in conclusion, our experience provide evidence that Othello GPT maintains a representation of game board states. That is the Othello world to produce sequences it was trained on. So I wanted to jump here real fast and just kind of like maybe over explain this thing a little bit, just in case people are not quite getting what is happening because this is kind of important. So here I have a notepad with, you know, it says E4, E5, D5, F4, et cetera. And then this, so it has, I believe 64 total moves. This is a game of Othello or River C or whatever, River C, whatever you want to call it. So they made this into a sentence with each coordinate being a word. So just like I would say, I went to the store today. This is that, but in Othello notation of how the players move. So it probably goes, I think black goes first. So it's black, white, black, white, etc. Until no moves are left. So they take this game, this sentence, and they make a whole book out of it. So many, many sentences. I forget the exact, are they using thousands or millions, whatever. A huge number of these games, aka sentences, and they feed it into the machine. And then we start asking the machine to predict moves. So let's say we get, you know, we play a game like this and we ask, okay, what do you think comes next? And it goes, well, I think H4 comes next. This is not surprising. Everyone agrees that it can do this. At this point, no one's denying its predictive abilities because what it's doing is it's sort of predicting, it's using statistics to predict the next move and it's getting pretty good at it. But where the community is kind of splitting up is that there's part of them that are saying it's just this, it's just statistics. It's just, it's just like a parrot that is just kind of repeating what it's heard. And there's nothing else going on beyond that. And so the other side of the debate, and as you see, Andrew No and Jeffrey Hinton, they talk about this. They're also saying, yeah, it is just statistics, but there seems to be some emerging skills and properties that are occurring that really seem like this thing is understanding what it's doing. It's building certain mental models that show that it's deducing, that it's inferring some information that we never told it about, that we never trained it to do. 
And so when we start probing into it and what we begin to realize that, it, you know, let's say we get to right here, prediction black E6. I mean, this is a fake game I made up. It has nothing to do with this, but let's say you're over here. The next thing it predicts is E6. So it's like, this is the next move. Fine. That makes total sense. But here's where it gets weird. We can start asking it to predict the state of all these other squares on the board. And again, we never told it that there was a board. We never told it there were squares. We never explained what the different states were. The different states are, you know, it's either empty or it has a black tile on it or it has a white tile on it. So, but that's what they mean by state is like, what, what's there? You know, nothing white or black. And so if this was just a statistical prediction machine, you know, and it spits out E6 is the next move. And we're like, oh, okay, but what's on A1? It would have no idea. It would say, what do you mean what's on A1, right? Well, there, there wouldn't be any concept of it thinking that there's something there or something isn't there. It might not even realize that this is where it is. It might not realize that there's a board. Like there's, it has no way of, of, of knowing this. This information was not given to it. And yet somehow it is able to visualize it, predict where all these other pieces are. And not only that, when it's trying to make its next move, these kind of colors show what squares it's looking at to make those predictions. So for example, I believe they said that red is high, blue is low. So the very red squares, it means that those are really taken into account in predicting the next move. Whereas the squares that are marked blue, not so much. So for example, let's say it's predicting that the white piece will be placed right here. What squares is it looking at to make that decision? Well, it's not this one. It doesn't care at all if this is empty or if it's white or if it's red. It cares not, right? It's looking kind of like at this, these squares to see. It's looking at the red squares to see that prediction. And so the contribution by what they mean by contribution, how much do the squares contribute to its prediction? The contribution is higher when changing the internal representation of square makes the prediction prediction less likely. What's funny is this reminded me of an episode from The Office, if you've ever watched that show, where Michael, the boss, who's supposed to be kind of not the smartest person in the room, he starts acting a little bit weird. And one of the employees, Oscar, who's more, probably one of the smarter characters, he has an idea. He thinks that the reason that Michael is acting weird is that he's aware that he can receive a certain bonus from the company if he completes some objective that kind of goes against the rest of the employees. So he asks him a question that normally Michael would not be able to answer. Do you know? Do I know what? I think you know. No. Does anyone happen to know what 15% of 4,300 is? $645. Michael's a genius. Right. Why did you say dollars? Because that is how my mind works. What's 15% of 200? Thank you, everyone. Michael is returning the surplus so he can keep 15% as a bonus. So the idea here is similar. Here's what we told it. Here's the information we gave it. We didn't tell it about a board. We didn't tell it about a square. We didn't tell it about tiles or whatever. So later when we ask, what's the state of this particular square? And it goes, oh, there's a black tile on it. That means it knows about the tile and the board and the square. It figured it out. It figured it out from this, from just rows and rows and lines and lines of this and nothing else. But why is this important? Like, who cares if they're building mental models or not? Here's a video clip that I think kind of shines some light on this. This is Jeffrey Hinton. So he's often referred to as the godfather of AI. He was the original person that really doubled down on neural networks, specifically something that resembled the human brain, the neural network of the human brain as being sort of the key that's going to unlock AI. And he held on to that belief for many decades when it was not the popular belief. Like he was going sort of against consensus, against you know, all the other experts in the field. And he held on to that belief and he said, no, it's going to be neural networks. And so it's, you know, 2023 now. And, uh, we're kind of like, yeah, the, <laughs> the dude was right. Let's take a look at this because these two guys are some of the brightest minds in AI. And, uh, it is important to know what they think. So let's dive in. And, uh, my name is Wes Roth. Thank you for watching. Yeah, I think it's fairly urgent for the researchers to come to a consensus about whether these big chatbots like GPT-4 or BARD actually understand what they're saying. Um, there's clearly some people believe they do and some people believe they're just stochastic parrots. And so long as we have that, those differences, um, we're not going to be able to come to a consensus about dangers. Yeah. And so I think it's sort of urgent from 
for the research community to address this issue of whether they understand or not. And I think both of us believe they do understand, but people we respect a lot, like Jan, think they don't really understand. And it's crucial to um, resolve this issue. And we may not be able to come to a consensus about other issues until we've resolved that issue. My view is that I believe the large language models and other large AI models are building a world model or building something that looks a lot like a world model. So my gut is that I do believe to the extent this building a world model is conveying learning some understanding of the world. And one aspect of this is the idea it's just statistics. And we all agree that in some sense, it has to be just statistics. All these things have is the statistics of their input. But many people who think it's just statistics are thinking in terms of things like trigram models or counting co-occurrence frequencies of words. And it's not just that. We believe that this process of creating features of embeddings and then interactions between features um, is actually understanding. Once you've, once you've um, taken the raw data of symbol strings and you can now predict the next symbol, not by things like trigrams, but by huge numbers of features interacting in very complicated ways to predict the features of the next word, and from that, make a prediction about the probability of next words. The point is, that is understanding. At least I believe that is understanding. I believe that's what our brains are doing too, that they're not just stochastic parrots.